Okay, so it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to chair this, first of all, with, with Betsy. Uh, this is a plenary session, this is the, the second plenary. It's a pleasure to, to introduce my, my colleague and our director, the International Agency for Research on Cancer in Lyon, France, Dr. Elisabetta Vidopas. I know she's absolutely capable of, of introducing herself and she's going to talk about the vision that she has for the agency and also the, particularly in the context of cancer surveillance, but I just wanted to say a couple words on Dr. Dr. Vidopas. I'm sure many of you, you know her, she's Brazilian, but she's also uh, Finnish and Swedish. She's, uh, and she's, she's been uh, really working in, in so many places and as, as many honorary positions too. An incredibly prolific cancer researcher and epidemiologist with close to 750 papers. I've known Elisabetta for about 20 years. Uh, we worked in, in the agency in Lyon and also uh, I worked uh, with her in the Cancer Registry of Norway. But she, since, uh, since May 2018, she became the director of the International Agency for Research on Cancer. At least she was elected by the Governing Council and she's been in position uh, since January and she's going to give her, her vision. And it's, uh, it's fantastic that she's here with us. So, Dr. Vidopas, over to you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, Fred, for this introduction, and uh, thank you, Betsy. I don't see Betsy. Oh, they, thank you for inviting me, Betsy. I'm delighted to be here. So although, as Fred explained, I am working with research administration now. My heart is really with cancer registry. So in the past 15 years, I have dedicated basically all my time working in cancer registries, in particular in the Nordic countries. So I'm going to brief you a little bit of uh, my vision for IARC and the role of cancer registries and cancer surveillance in the, at IARC in the years to come. So first of all, uh, global cancer data for cancer action. Do we know what's around the corner? And I think we do. I mean, we know that cancer is the leading cause of premature death in every country in the world, and that says a lot. So it is a priority worldwide. And it's clear that throughout the 21st century, cancer will continue being the major cause of uh, premature death worldwide. It has many implications, social, economic, medical, uh, and we need to do something about it. And our role in this community in particular is to monitor the epidemic. So we know that it's important, it's continue to be important, and we know that uh, counting cancer, incidence, mortality, prevalence, is part of the solution to find ways to curb the epidemic. The world is in a demographic and mortality transition. We see reductions in fertility and, and increases in longevity in every country. And they contribute to population overall growth and aging. The growth is expected to be particularly high in lower middle income countries. And the population aging will also be mostly accentuated in the poorest countries on earth. These countries will face a growing cancer epidemic do mainly because of the demographic transition, aging or growth of the population and aging of the population. So the cancer profile worldwide is also changing. So in particularly in lower middle income countries, before we had most cancers related to infectious disease, and currently this is changing. We have many more cancers now related to affluence, for instance, to diet, to bad diet, increased consumption of alcohol and obesity, among others. So what do we know about the numbers? How many cancer cases we have globally in 2018? So our best estimates is that 18.1 million new cancer cases occurred last year. And they are distributed unevenly across the world. Most of them occur actually in Asia where about 60% of the global population uh, lives. In Europe, uh, where we have a much smaller proportion of the world population, we have 23% of all cancer cases. In the Americas, 21%. 
in Africa, 5.8% and in Oceania, 1.4%. The picture for mortality is slightly different. We had about 9.6 million cancer deaths in 2018, and here the vast majority is definitely in Asia. We have also proportionally high mortality than incidence in Africa due, due to many reasons, but most sadly, late diagnosis and lack of adequate infrastructure for a uh, timely treatment. So this is a challenge and that's a challenge for all of us and I think all of us has a, have a role to play in changing this, this, this picture in the next few years. So this graph is a little bit complicated so, and probably difficult to see from behind, so I will try to walk you through. So the different regions of the world, for each of these regions on the left side uh, are the, the most uh, incident cancers in women, and in the right hand side from each figure in men. And what they show is that basically in all regions worldwide, breast cancer is the number one challenge in terms of cancer incidence globally. It is followed by either colorectal cancer in most regions or lung cancer. In Maine, the picture is of course very different with prostate cancer being a main challenge throughout the world, except in Asia where number one is still lung cancer which you know is associated with an incredibly high mortality. So how is the cancer profile according to the Human Development Index, which is a summary measure of the average ach achievements of key dimensions of human development, such as longevity and healthy life, education and decent standard of living. Again, this map is quite complex, so I will try to walk you through it. So the regions displayed in dark blue are the very high human development index, like North America and Europe, Australia, and the south of South America. The light blue, the high uh, uh, human development index. The uh, orange are the medium development index, and the red, the low development index. And then in the figures for high, very high, high, medium, and low, I have listed the five most common cancer cases in each region, in blue men and in red for women. What we see is that there is a huge difference in incidence with regions of the world which have a very high human development index having about two to three times more cancer incidence than regions with low human development index. For mortality, the picture is different. They, they, is, they are much closer, the low uh, human development index, to the high ones because the reasons we already discussed, namely late diagnosis and poor uh, treatment in these regions. Again, this is a global challenge and it's our responsibility to contribute to change this picture. So, cancers now in 2018 and the projections for 2040 worldwide. Last year, 8.1 million cancer cases, and each of these figures represent half a million persons. By 2040, we expect 62% increase in the total number of cases and expect 29.4 million cases. Again, this increase will mainly be explained by demographic changes, aging in the population, and overall increasing the number of people globally. So how will the numbers be in, uh, for cancer incidence and mortality if the, the incidence and mortality rates continue exactly as they are today? This is in the, the blue line is what we see. So no changes in incidence and mortality, but the numbers is still increase the, dramatically of the overall number of people being affected. These are two different projections. The red one is assuming a 2% increase in cancer incidence and mortality, and the numbers really explode. And the green line, which is the bottom line, is just representing if it would be a decrease of 2% in cancer incidence and mortality. So if we would have a decrease, we still would have the same number of people being affected as per today. But the most likely scenario is actually the middle one. 
That means a, a very substantial number of overall number of cases, incidence and mortality. No country in the world, not even US and Canada, are prepared for the massive increase in number of patients. There are not enough doctors, there are not enough hospitals, there are not enough ways to treat all these people. So prevention is the only way to go to tackle this tsunami of patients that we all our countries will face in the, in the near future. So how is the world reacting to this problem? So I assume all of you have heard about the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which for the first time, the, uh, the United Nations listed non-communicable diseases as, as very important because they represent, in fact, over 35 million deaths each year worldwide. And in the agenda for the Sustainable Development Goals uh, in, that was discussed in the United Nations in, 2000, uh, in, in 2015, the countries committed themselves to reduce the impact of these diseases by 25% by 2025 and by 30% in 2013. This is a, a massive effort, will be needed to, to reach uh, these targets of 25% reduction in 2025 uh, and 30% in 2013. So time to deliver actions to prevent cancer and to deliver them now, otherwise the targets will not be reached. So how cancer stands in terms of premature mortality due to non-communicable diseases? Again, this is a colored map, and the darkest colors represent the uh, countries where malignant neoplasms or cancers rank number one as premature mortality, meaning mortality for those up to age 70 across the world. The, the light red re is where cancer represents the second cause of premature mortality for NCDs, the orange the third, the yellow the fourth, and the white the uh, below that. I will display some estimates for the BRICS, uh, the BRIC countries, so that you have a feeling of uh, what is, uh, what, uh, how cancer, how important is cancer also in the developing world. In this graph, cancer is displayed in light blue, showing the importance in South Africa. Here in India, is still below uh, cardiovascular disease and infectious disease, but increasing in importance. In China, already almost catching up with cardiovascular diseases, so it's a major increase from recent years, as well as in Russia, so catching up with cardiovascular disease. When we look in Brazil, same thing, catching up with cardiovascular diseases, and in Europe as well, just as a comparison. So, which is the progress made so far in relation to the sustainable, sustainable development goals in the last 15 years, and how much more we need to work to, to, to come through the 25 or 30% reduction? So, this, in, the left, in the right part of this graph, they are low and medium human development index countries listed, and I listed five countries. And in the left panel, the high and very high human development index countries. And you can see in the, in the uh, first uh, circles how the uh, impact was in 2000, and then how it changed in 2015. However, to reach the goals by 2030 is still much more effort needs to be done until we reach a lower level in all these countries. The effort will need to be much more significant in low and middle uh, human development index countries. So which is the impact that the progress against the sustainable development goals will have uh, worldwide? So in this graph, I listed uh, the impact again in the BRICS. So overall, globally, is the gain will be of 21 trillion US dollars, and this is very significant. 
So showing you then for the BRICS in Brazil, for example, the expected uh, gain is, corresponds to 0.21% of the gross uh, national product or 4.6 billion. In Russia, 5 billion or 0.25% of GB GDP. In India, 0.36% of uh, the GDP or 6.7 billion. And in China, 0.34% of GDP or 25 billion. In South Africa, 0.49% of the GDP or 1.9 billion. And in Europe is a much bigger, of course, is 0.58% of the GDP, 75.5 billion US dollars. So the money is to be saved by decreasing the, in, the impact of cancer in populations and uh, is, is truly immense and very significant throughout the world, in Europe, in the developed countries, but most importantly in low and middle income countries. So, what is the International Agency for Research on Cancer doing to contribute to all this effort? And before I go into details, I will very briefly explain what is this organization, because many of you may not know about it. So, the IR, or International Agency for Research on Cancer, is the cancer agency from the World Health Organization, or WHO. It was created in 1965 by a resolution of the World Health Assembly. And the World Health Assembly is the annual meeting where all ministries of health and their cabinets from all countries meet for about 10 days to discuss important issues that impact us all and take common decisions. So the initiative was launched by leading French public figures and the, it, and the city of Lyon in France make a very generous donation to allow us to install our buildings there. The idea was that nations could unite to curb a growing global health threat, which was cancer. So IARC has now over 50 years of history. We started with six founding members or founding countries, which was France, Germany, Italy, UK, US, and Australia. And today we have 26 countries contributing to the organizations. Most of you sitting in this room uh, are from countries that are part of IARC. So you are part of IARC, and you are, are part of the research or, the, or the, the government supporting the initiatives of this organization. So what do we do? We do research, original research, and we stimulate a lot of collaboration and interaction interdisciplinary across disciplines in, in all countries, being participating countries or others. We also have a very important component of capacity building. So at any given point in time, over one third of our population are students actually, usually postgraduate students. And we have a worldwide focus. So we work uh, as per today in over 170 countries. So it's a massive uh, network of collaborators. But our focus is in low and middle income countries. So there are three main areas of IARC work. Basically, we describe the occurrence of cancer, and we have a very active group in this area, and many of our collaborators are attending these meetings. We also have a very large uh, proportion of our staff that works uh, understanding the causes of cancer, doing etiological research. And we also have the mandate to evaluate preventive measures and implementa in implementation of cancer preventive measures, as well as evaluating cancer hazard to humans. So these are some examples of the publications that we have the Global Cancer st Statistics, the IARC monographs, the handbooks for cancer prevention, the WHO classification of tumors, which is the Bible of pathology worldwide, and several IARC working group reports. The organization is actually quite small. We are only 350 scientists, from 50 different nations currently. But we have a very extended network of collaborations globally, which allows us to do quite a lot of international work. 
So in particular for you, I think what you are most interested in is, is the work that we do in cancer registration. And that you describe a little bit more in detail what this is. So the main product or the most known product is cancer incidence in five continents. And now we are in volume 11. And this volume 11 was published electronically in 2017 in your conference, in the International Association of Cancer Registries Conference that we have in Utrecht. And about one year later, it was also released in paper format and circulated to all cancer registries uh, worldwide, in particular to those contributing data. So we have a website where all information can be found free of charge, downloaded, and it's very useful for your work daily, but also for teaching purposes. So how this, this uh, initiative of doing cancer incidents in five continents evol evolved throughout time? It started actually the first volume in 66. So it's 53 years ago. And then in the beginning, the first and second volume, they have uh, less years in between then, uh, in terms of how many years interval they included. But then in subsequent volumes, basically they include five years data. And then uh, this graph in the, in the uh, vertical lines, the black ones are the number of countries, the light gray is the number of registers, and the dark gray, the number of populations included in each volume. And what you can see is, is, is a trend in time of increasing number of countries, registries, and populations. Until we reach the volume 11, where we have a very substantial amount of, of populations included, 465 from 343 cancer registries in 65 countries. So it's a rather massive effort to collate all this data, control its quality, and uh, make a publication which has comparable quality throughout the world. So how, how are the continents represented in these publications? And here I, I just listed the percentage, the, the coverage in, in cancer incidence in five continents uh, for each continent, for the different volumes. And what you can see is that North America is really best in class. And since the volume eight, a massive effort has been made to increase cancer registration in North America. And now it's very close to 100% of, of coverage. So it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic achievement. Oceania is not doing bad, but the population, of course, is much smaller. Europe is a little bit below 50% currently. And then there come the other continents, which are much smaller proportion of coverage of uh, high quality cancer registries. South America, Asia, and Africa is very low indeed. So we hope that in the next years, these continents that are, they have a low representation in this publication will uh, increase. So what is news in, in the volume 11 uh, regarding the state of registration? So there are registries submitting in great numbers, in particular from low and middle income countries. And there is expansion of population-based cancer registries, notably from China. And we have one colleague here that is the responsible for these cancer registries, and he can tell us a lot about this, this tremendous expansions. We also have several registries that have been accepted for the first time in the publication. There are, as always, challenges. For example, the increase in the accepted databases was mainly for high-income countries. We have no submission for three long-standing contributors, Finland, Sweden, and Singapore, and this is mainly due to changes in legislation, which are very strictly interpreted in these countries as compared to neighboring countries. And also, there were a few registries that were included in volume 10 that were not included in volume 11. So it's always a challenge to keep up the, the quality and including everyone. China is, is a 
fantastic change in the uh, in, in my lifetime. So I think for many of you also, to, just to see what's going on in China is, is quite dramatic. So as per 2019, my understanding is that there are over 600 registries currently in, uh, in China. And 100 of two of them submitted data to volume 11. So it's a massive uh, change in cancer registration in Africa. And this map just show one, one trip that, that people working in the volume 11 did uh, to visit different registries and it took them 29 hours to go from one extreme to the country to the other and not even reach, visiting all uh, registries that had submitted data. Regions that we are still struggling and here, in particular, I want to talk about Africa. So we do have an uh, African Cancer Registry Network, which is very active. They have a lot of courses, a lot of training, a lot of support for their staff. But the challenges are immense. It's a very big region. Resources are scarce. Governments don't prioritize cancer registration. So it's really, really hard to keep the cancer registries ongoing. But we, we are doing our best. So it's, uh, I see that there are not many colleagues from Africa in this, re in this meeting in particular. And this is a pity. So let's hope that in the next meetings, we will manage to attract more of our colleagues uh, to participate. So one of the challenges is that not all cancer registries in this region are population based. Most of them are not, in fact. So how come we? came this far. So what, uh, how is it possible? Because it, it is indeed a massive global effort to be able to register so much, so much disease in, in a systematic way for so many decades, over five, 55 decades. So who were these visionaries that, that paved the way for the work that we are doing today? It started actually a quite a long time ago, so in the 1920s. We know of can a cancer registry in Hamburg in 27, the cancer registration in Connecticut in 41, in New York in 40, in Denmark in 42. And then we know of other initiatives. And for example, there was a meeting in Copenhagen for in 1946, where the researchers then, uh, discuss the great benefit that would be to collect cancer information in a systematic way in as many countries as possible, in a comparable way. And how good it would be that each nation would have a central cancer registry to collate all this information, and that it should be an international body then to collect all information across continents in a comparable way, uh, and to draw statistics on it. And there we came, uh, progress continue, and the, you can see several historical figures, and the, the, the second from the right to the left is a young Sir Richard Dole, that many of you read his papers in your medical school or your epidemiological courses. He was quite instrumental in all this process. You can see also Calon Muir, the, the third figure to the, to the, from the left to the right, and Max Parkin, who is still active, in particular in the cancer registries in Africa. And then you can see in the, in the uh, horizontal line the evolution of cancer, major initiatives in cancer registration, major organizations doing cancer registration globally. IARC, as I mentioned, was created in 65 and started since its inception to take a leading role in cancer registration. The volume one in uh, cancer incidence in five continents was published in 1966, and both volume one and two, Richard Dow was the, the, the key publisher. The International Association of Cancer Registers was also founded in 66, SEER in 73, the Nordic Association of Cancer Registries in 84, and the European Network of Cancer Registries in 89. So this is also a historic picture uh, taken in Oslo in the cancer registry that I was working for many years, where we see many of the pioneers in cancer registration. Ruth Steinitz, that was one of the editors, one of the first guidelines for cancer registration worldwide. William Hensel, and many of you have studied the mantel hensel test. This is the person who was uh, developing it, who 
he actually wrote the, the first draft of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, laws and regulations for the International Association of Cancer Registry. Richard Dahl in the middle, the editor of the first and second volume of Cancer and Dancing Five Components. Sidney Cutler from NCI, who was the proponent of the International Association of Cancer Registries, and other figures from the Nordic countries and Japan that were instrumental in developing the organization that we are now uh, carrying on the, the, the work. So how was the expansion of cancer registration to, uh, from the 80s? If you look at the map of Italy, you are see that it, it's getting more and more red over time, and then you see blues, which are, uh, the red are the population-based cancer registries, the, the blues are the hospital-based, and you see that they, they, they are changing over time. So with time passing, more and more registers are being developed. This development, as in many other countries, has been an unplanned process. And registries were fund, founded and funded through various organizations in a disorganized way. And governments and policymakers would only try to catch up uh, postdoc after the registers had been founded in an attempt to systematize and rationalize the situation and, and control the quality. So this was, is the same story not only in Italy, but in many other countries, including France, UK, Japan, US, Germany, and Netherlands. I think China and probably Russia are the only exceptions where, where there was a top-down initiative and, and decision to implement uh, registries throughout the country. Here is a picture from 2015, so only four years ago, where there were only 308 uh, cancer registries in China. As you remember, a minute ago I told you that, the, that there are now, in 2019, over 600. So they really scale up 300 reg new registries in, in, in a few years. So, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a massive amount of, uh, uh, of the population cover and money invested from the Chinese government in this initiative. So here, the, the geographical uh, coverage of cancer registries, and here I take volume 9, but there is not a dramatic difference from volume 10. In North America, 98% of coverage, 69 of 71 registers were accepted in cancer incidents in five continents, and two countries contributing, US and Canada included. In uh, Europe, 46% coverage, 127 of 143 registers accepted, 28 out of 31 countries. In Oceania, 77% uh, coverage, 12 registers accepted of the two countries contributing, Australia and New Zealand. Latin America and Caribbean, there we are still lagging behind, only 8% coverage. So there are several Latin American colleagues here, so we really need to scale up this, so there's a lot of work to do. Only 31 of 45 registers were accepted from 10 countries. From Asia, 7% coverage, despite the efforts, in, in particularly in China. Uh, 97 of 182 registers were accepted from 17 of 21 countries. But look at, at Africa only 1% coverage. This is far too low. So it's a big, big uh, lack of data in an immense continent. O only seven of 30 registers were accepted from six countries out of 21 having some sort of cancer uh, registration activity. So where do we want to be? in this century, so until the end of our careers, what's, what are our objectives, or at least the objectives that I traced for, for IARC together with my collaborators? So support, uh, as much as possible, registries and collaboration using data from registries. And here, the International Association of Cancer Registries is absolutely fundamental, has, has, has a pivotal role in developing the support and the collaboration, as well as the Global Initiative for Cancer Registry Development, and I'm going to discuss this a little bit further. Also, 
develop further global indicators, such as the Global Cancer Observatory, and expand descriptive epidemiological research, including international cancer survival benchmarking across the world. So the vision for 2030 is, uh, in terms of registry support and collaboration, through the uh, Global Initiative for Cancer Registry Development, is to progressively and sustainably develop the and with quality assured population-based cancer registry in every country of the world as a key driver for cancer control and cancer research and empowered by credible registry networks at national, regional, continental and global levels. In the first map, you can see vast area of the world which are dark without proper population-based cancer registration. And in 2030, we want to be as the second map where basically all country in the world is covered by population-based cancer registries. How to do that? And here I borrow the, uh, a framework of, for cancer surveillance developed by my colleague Marion Pinheiros and published in the Epidemiological Reviews in 2017. Basically, she proposes a general framework for cancer surveillance that permits monitoring the core components for cancer control. So you can see on the top prevention, early detection, treatment and care, palliative and end of life care, and the population evolving from healthy to newly diagnosed with cancer from living with cancer and dying of cancer. And the basic surveillance measures that we, 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 we do already, which is cancer incidence and survival in the middle by cancer type and by stage, using population-based cancer registries. We think it's very important to expand with quality registration of risk factors, but also population surveys, which are done in many countries, but are not yet incorporated in the system of cancer registration, as well as improving the quality of mortality registration in vi and vital statistics. Many countries in the world lack entirely mortality registration and vital statistics, and, and, all, and therefore, Denominators are impossible to calculate, and if you don't have a denominator, you cannot be sure about any estimates. Similarly, mortality, registration, quality of registration must be dramatically improved uh, for us to, to be sure what we are talking about uh, and measuring in terms of progress. So regarding the extended surveillance uh, measures, I think it's very important that we work further with attributable risk, uh, description of prevalence in each country, DALIS, and associated economic costs. Economy arguments are usually the only arguments that governments accept. So it's important that we develop our capacity in health economy to be able to make the case that preventing cancer is a worthwhile effort. So a few words about the Global Initiative for Cancer Registry Development, which is a coordinated response uh, to tackle the need of improving cancer registration worldwide. This initiative was la launched in 2012, and it's a partnership uh, seeking measurable improvement in the coverage, quality, and national networking capacity of cancer registries in low- and middle-income countries. So the GRCR is the first global strategy to increase the capacity to produce high quality data to inform cancer control planning. And it's a flexible model uh, to support over 150 countries through six regional hubs worldwide. And the vision is to benefit the patients by reducing barriers in data collection, to produce stronger evidence to guide programs, to train a new generation of professionals to better integrate with policymakers, and to develop electronic tools to lower cost and modernize healthcare information systems. So the idea behind it is to produce data 
that we will based our action as public health professionals. We rec recognize that there is a need uh, to do so because of the increasing cancer burden worldwide and the transition in, in terms of mortality and morbidity in lower middle income countries from infectious disease to non-communicable diseases, including cancer. And there is a need for continuous quality assured data for planning, monitoring, and evaluating cancer control plans. We also recognize that there is a immense inequality in terms of cancer registration globally and that low and middle income countries are lagging behind and need to be helped to catch up with the uh, standards of modern cancer registration. We see many opportunities in particular because of the momentum of the non-communicable diseases vis-a-vis -vis the United Nations and the World Health Organization. They have but in the last years for the first time NCDs include cancers as a global priority. And the action we propose is, is to canalize efforts to the Global Initiative for Cancer Registry Development. So which are the bases for this initiative? It's country leadership, so the countries decide how to do it, and we in, in the network provide support according to their needs, which is tailor-made. And the focus is entirely regional. Therefore, the regional hubs that know the, the, the local particularities of each region and are close to the, to, to, to the people need, in needing help to support their cancer registration initiatives. And working also together with collaborative centers which support and expand the outreach of the initiative. And there is a global coordination that at the moment is done by IARC to standardize process, teaching material, and also help to, to plan uh, all the activities. Many organizations are participating, and I have listed them on the right-hand side, so I think you probably will recognize many of them, American Cancer Society, CDC, IAEA, National Cancer Institute, UICC, ESMO, and several other organizations. So the organizations have been very generous in contributing funds and ideas and support to this initiative. So these are the regional hubs that, that we have in each region. So it's mainly uh, Latin America, Africa, North America, and parts of Asia, then a hub for Asia, and one in the uh, Polynesia. And these are some of the coordinators. So what do they do? A lot of training, delivering basic and advanced courses, de development of uh, accompanying resources for the courses, network, like fostering relationships between different disciplines, providing information on upcoming activities, and they give also direct support to the registries in terms of site visits and review process, and they do consultancy and mentorship to, to sort particular issues. And they also stimulate cancer research and help the colleagues in cancer registries to develop research programs. So they have, the, the GRCR has major planned activities uh, in terms of knowledge transfer and training as the GICR net which is a selection and support for regional trainers, the principle of training the trainers to be able to expand knowledge, the mentorship program, and online resources such as e-learning developing across hubs, uh, hubs and adopted in different regions, and the best practice portal as well as expanded partnerships and, and agreements have been signed between different organizations and associations and there are now many collaborating centers providing in-kind contribution as well as direct contribution to cancer registries in, uh, in need and, and doing joint uh, work plans uh, with key organizations such as IARC, WHO and others. Also, the increased country support is going on with site visits and follow-ups. And 
with over 20 GICR partner countries intensifying training and consultancies, and also the development of CANREG 5 Plus, which is a tool for cancer registration, very used in low and middle income countries, which is also used for analysis and reference for publications. So we plan to accelerate the support uh, to cancer registries, uh, in particular in low and middle income countries in the, in the next uh, de de years and decades, and developing the, this concept of the, of the hub. So we have developed a, a strategy with a vision with very specific outcomes, strategic goals and foundation, and we are following and monitoring the progress uh, throughout time. So I would just like to give an example of one of the activities of the GICR net, which are the developments in CANREG 5, which has now a much more interactive and easy to use uh, ways to develop graphs. Uh, it incorporates ideas for new features for data entry and additional analytic functionality. And it also is able now in very short time to incorporate new developments and suggestions by users. Just give a few examples of the descriptive epidemiological work that we are also doing at IARC in terms of primary prevention. And I believe the author of this paper is in the audience as well. Uh, this is showing in the first line the uh, proportion of women and men in the U.S. who smoke and in the second line the incidence of lung cancer in the U.S. And what it shows in the horizontal line is that there is a gap of 30 years between the peak amount of smoking and the peak incidence in, uh, in lung cancer in America. And we see in the third line the incidence of smoking in Chinese men and in the fourth line in Indonesian men. So with this data, we can pretty much predict which is going to be the incidence of lung cancer, not only in China and Indonesia, but in all countries in the world using cancer registry data and based in models from different countries. So this is one of the examples of the research with descriptive data we are doing at IARC. Other example here, also using uh, lung cancer incidence from the volume 11 of cancer incidence in, in five continents. In the right panel, in the top part, you see the decrease in age standardized incidence per 100,000 for lung cancer in men, in US blacks, in men in the Netherlands, in US whites, and in the in United Kingdom. And in the dotted lines, you see the increase, or in the best case scenario, the stable trends in women. In the left-hand side panel, you see the age standardized rates uh, of lung cancer in the dotted line, as well as the overall number of deaths of lung cancer in the UK uh, predictions until 2013. So this is the sort of uh, descriptive epidemiological studies that we are doing for many countries across the world as well as teaching the next generation of epidemiologists, cancer epidemiologists, to use this data for their own uh, healthcare planning. So I will say very briefly a few words about the international survival benchmarking. And I will be very brief because there will be other sessions in this conference where this project will be discussed in detail. I think in particular in, on, on Thursday afternoon, there is, a, there is a session about it. So first about SURVCAN. What's SURVCAN 3? is the, the third version of, of a project that started actually in 99 with Cervican 1 and then in 2011 with Cervican 2. And it's a population-based study in low and middle income countries which tries to map the survival of, of uh, cancer patients across 84 cancer registries and 37 countries. We know that cancer survival is a key measure of overall effectiveness of healthcare system. 
There are many countries in, in, in rich parts of the world that have a quite substantial amount of data on survival. But survival studies in low and middle income countries are, are rare, and their quality is usually poor. So this is one initiative trying to, to tackle this problem. There is another initiative which is called SurveMark, and this is this, the second uh, initiative of this kind, which also the first one started many years ago, and it include, includes eight cancer types, colon, liver, lung, esophagus, ovarian, pancreas, rectal, and stomach, all of these having relatively poor prognosis, this time in rich countries, and include uh, seven rich countries, UK, Ireland, Denmark, Norway, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. It's a multidisciplinary study, including uh, and trying to do benchmarking, meaning comparing countries with each other using the this cancer types, uh, statistics by sex, age, stage, including incidence and mortality trends, but also including recommendations about staging and registration practice and user-friendly interactive online tools. And again, training fellows to, to, to these techniques and to do this type of study. So the, the early career training is always a component in any of the studies that we do. This is very small and very difficult to read, so I will just browse you through the idea of, of the, the results that this study is producing. So each line represents a country, and the horizontal lines is, is the, uh, the timeline when the, the, the cancer uh, statistics were collected. And all these cancer types are these cancer types that have very poor survival. And basically, for all these countries studied, what we see is a trend of increasing survival over time for each cancer in each country. However, the progress is different and in different speeds in each country. And now, what the researchers are doing is try to understand the causes, map them, and then have a dialogue with the countries about, uh, about these differences and how to improve the situation. One of the tools that probably many of you know is the Globocan, which is uh, estimates of cancer incidence, mortality, and prevalence, and prevalence worldwide in 2018, compiled in an interactive website, which is very easy to use, and in particular for teaching purposes, is extremely helpful. The students really like using it. So it, it also includes a, uh, the component of cancer today, it's what's going on now, cancer tomorrow, predictions for the future, cancer trends, and also causes of cancer. So if you have not yet done so, I really encourage you to, to play around with the graphs and the data in this website. It's very interactive and very easy to use and quite helpful. So which are the future challenges for cancer registration worldwide? One challenge that I already mentioned in the beginning is, is the, um, the low level of reporting in countries with low human development index. So in this graph, the rich countries with high human development index are the dark blue followed by the high development index, the, the light blue, the medium development index, orange, and the low in red. And when I plot the amount of, the, of cancer registries included in cancer incidents in five continents, what you can see is that most of them cluster in rich countries. And when I, we plot the high quality cancer registries, the trend is very clear. So basically, almost all of them are really concentrated in, reg in affluent regions with poor regions have uh, very limited register activity or no register activity at all. This is due to limited resources and expertise, but also competing public health problems, and limited awareness of the future burden and economic impact of cancer. So this is a challenge that I think we need to tackle. The challenges occur both in low and middle income countries, and, but also in high income countries. 
In low and middle income countries, I think the main challenge is starting cancer registries and developing them to become population-based cancer registries with support from the stakeholders. Sustainability is an issue. Many cancer registries are started and then after a few years they die, mainly because of lack of economical support to pay staff and or consumables, for example. Uh, there are also challenges in high-income countries in terms of sustainability. As you will recall, I told you earlier that some registries that were included in the 10th volume in cancer incidence in five continents were not included in the 11th volume. So this is a, a challenge throughout the world. But threats for both high and low income countries is the perception of weak data, that cancer registry data is not enough, that there is a need of more clinical registers instead, and that big data is the answer for everything, that there is no need to carry on cancer registration in the way that we have been doing so far. There are also national agendas that sometimes do not include cancer registration at all, and confidentiality issues, in particular in Europe, where registration has become a challenge. This is a paper published by uh, my colleague, Dr. Sisling, in 2015, showing that in Europe, cancer registries data are mainly used to, for instance, survive and survival and sometimes mortality, but very little for other purposes, such as cancer con control, clinical audits, clinical guidelines, screening evaluation, and device evaluation. So there is a huge amount of potential for further use of cancer registry data. Here I just listed a few publications indicating uses of cancer registry data and discussions about use of cancer registry data in terms of data protection, data quality, biobanking, and screening. So finally, what do we need? Of course, we need big data to ring and we need to reinforce uh, electronic registration system. But what we need most of all is more population-based registries with improved quality of data, with data collection and management carefully monitoring, and we need to train staff that will continue doing this work in the future. We need to use the data for surveillance and research proposals and also for healthcare planning. And in conclusion, I think the cancer registries are the most developed disease surveillance system in the entire world. And it is an unsurpassed resource more heavily utilized than any other surveillance system. And this ha has been very well described by Dr. Ward from the Georgia Cancer Registry in a publication. So there are many opportunities for novel solutions and for expanding activities given the political NCD impetus and the Millennium Development Goals. As my Brazilian mentor wrote in this Lancer article, I think that there is a need uh, of rather increasing investment in the production and dissemination of global estimates that sometimes are just estimates, not really based in data. There is a need of increasing domestic and international support, in, particularly in low and middle income countries, to develop and sustain institutional knowledge and skills for data generation, analysis, interpretation, and translation. So more real data and less estimates. So, and this is what we are trying to do, generate more data. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vaidapas, for this uh, global exposition, very entertaining and informative, looking at the uh, surveillance, uh, the, the, the burden and the gaps, and, and also the solutions we have globally. I think we have no time for questions, alas, uh, so we're going to move to the, 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 the next two presentations, and I ask my, my co-moderator, Dr. Bessie Kula, who's coming up to uh, moderate the rest of the session. Over to you, Betsy. Thank you.
Thanks. I'd like to, um, first of all, welcome everyone to the combined meeting. It's a joy to really see my NACER family and my IACR family in the same room. We're like uh, two sides of the family getting together, so it's a pleasure to see you all here. Um, I have the uh, pleasure of introducing the next two speakers. Um, I'm going to introduce them both at once, and maybe they can come forward. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Dr. Catherine Shang. Uh, Dr. Shang is the director of the Victorian Cancer Registry in Australia. And the Victorian Cancer Registry has embraced innovative technology to improve the completeness and accuracy of data um, in the registry data set and to build the capacity and the capability to manage large and increasing numbers of data sources and records. She's going to talk to us about artificial intelligence to improve case ascertainment in a population-based registry. And following that, a uh, little bit of a turn on the same idea is uh, Dr. Allison Van Dyke, who will speak on the future of digital pathology and cancer surveillance. Dr. Van Dyke is the director of the SEER-linked virtual tissue repo repository and pilot studies and part of the data quality analysis interpretation branch at the surveillance research program at the uh, USNCI. Dr. Van Dyke earned her MD, PhD at Wayne State University of Medicine and in 2011 was graduate training in cancer biology. Her doctoral research focused on the role of inflammation in non-small non -cell, non cell can lung cancer among women and included SEER data. And she completed a couple of uh, postgraduate and residency programs, and I think she must be a professional student. So, um, if I could ask Dr. Shang and um, Dr. Van Dyke to come forward. So firstly, I'd like to thank, thank you all for your kind invitation to present some of the work that we've been doing at the uh, Victorian Cancer Registry in Melbourne, Australia. And today I'm going to talk to you about a project that we've been undertaking for quite some time to use artificial intelligence to improve case finding. So pathology reports for the Victorian Cancer Registry are regarded um, as the most valid information for the confirmation of a diagnosis of cancer. In 2011, to address our known under-reporting of cancer pathology due to poor case-finding systems used by pathology labs, we undertook a pilot study of two PATH labs to test the commercial software ePath Reporter. So ePath Reporter is a Canadian product. Um, it's developed by artificial intelligence in medicine and it is an automated cancer notification system. And from our initial pilot study, AIM ePath technology demonstrated high levels of reporting accuracy and com completeness using the artificial intelligence case finding. So from the success of the pilot study, we commenced a larger project to replace existing paper and electronic pathology notification systems with the ePath reporter at an additional 15 laboratories. So artificial intelligence in medicine developed ePath reporter software to automate the review of pathology reports electronically and to accurately identify cases of cancer and forward these automatically to the registry. So in each laboratory, we have installed Transmed EDI and AI engine software. The software can read HL7 messages from the, the from the laboratory information system and using the AI engine reviews all reports and identifies any reports that are reportable to the registry. So all the reports identified are encrypted and delivered over the internet to the Victorian Cancer Registry. So the EPATH case finding criteria was optimised for each laboratory, and this was done in collaboration with AIM to ensure 100% sensitivity and a minimum of 98% specificity. So today I'm very pleased to say we have 94% of all pathology cancer notifications submitted electronically to the registry 
And to quantify the impact of EPATH, we have looked at pre and post EPATH. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So as I said, today we have 94% of all pathology um, submitted electronically. And to look at the effect of EPATH, we've looked pre and post EPATH. And so that's between 2010, which is pre-EPATH, and 2017, post-EPATH. We have seen 60% increase in the total number, number of eligible pathology reports submitted, increase in reports for ancillary studies and review tests, contributing to more accurate and precise diagnosis and classification, and an overall 32% increase in tumours registered. There's been a 20% decrease in the number of ineligible reports submitted, which has significantly reduced data workloads. So the pathology reports are submitted now to the registry in near real time. So that's generally within 24 hours. So as I said, EPATH reporter project started in 2011, and it's been phased over eight years to include 15 pathology labs. So this graph shows the number of eligible pathology notifications submitted per year, and you can see that over the years of EPATH implementation, there has been a corresponding increase in the number of notifications. The last lab came online in May this year, so we expect the number of notifications to start to plateau. For 2017 year of diagnosis, we had a 60% increase in eligible cancer pathology reports, and currently we're processing, we have processed 60% of tumours for 2018 year of diagnosis, and are predicting a 100% increase in the number of notifications. And that's illustrated in the orange bar graph, bar. So this clearly demonstrates that EPATH reporter um, has significantly increased on the number of eligible reports um, submitted to the registry and has performed at a greater level than that which was originally being used um, in pathology labs, which was often registrars hitting a radio button or a simple trap, um, using simple um, language trap methods. So pre-implementation of EPATH, we estimated 20% under-reporting of histopathology and 35% under-reporting for haematology. What we found was considerably um, greater than what we first thought. So we saw a 127% increase in reports for haematology between 2010 and 2017 and a 51% increase in reports for solid tumours a 62% increase in histology reports, which um, led to an increase, which was included in this was an increase in core and other biopsies. And we saw a 69% increase in cytology reports. There was also a 35% increase in ancillary studies and a greater than 400% increase in reviews. So overall, all of these increases have contributed to a more accurate ascertainment of date of diagnosis and has improved accuracy in tumour classifications. As a consequence of EPATH Reporter, we have seen an increase in the number of tumours created over and above that expected by the growing and ageing population in Victoria. If we look at our pre and post EPATH implementation period of 2010 to 2017 year of diagnosis, we would expect a 23% increase which represents 3% per year cumulative increase. In fact, what we have seen is a 32% overall increase in tumours registered. Of the solid tumours, we can see a 118% increase in reporting of, the in, of in situ tumours, 13% increase in reporting of invasive tumours, 28% decrease in the reporting of tumours of uncertain behaviour, and a 19% increase in benign tumour reporting.
we also saw a 32% increase in haematological malignancies, and of this, 68% represented an increase in specific leukaemias, with a corresponding decrease in ill-defined leukaemias. And we also, also saw a 170% increase in haematological malignancies of uncertain behaviour, MGUS in particular. So here we are showing the impact of population growth and ageing and EPATH reporter on tumour counts from 2005 to 2016. The number of tumours registered in 2005 is our baseline in dark blue. In light blue, we have added the increase in tumours registered due to population growth and ageing and incidence trends. In orange, we have, in we have shown the increase due to the implementation of EPATH. So one of the international measures of a registry's data quality is the proportion of cases registered based on death certificate only information, the death certificate only percentage. From 2010 to 2016, we have seen a decrease in DCO percentage. For solid tumours, there has been a DCO percentage decrease from 2.7% to 1.5%. For haematological tumours, we have seen a DCO percent decrease from 4.4% to 1.9%. So this graph shows the number of EPATH and non-EPATH notifications received per haematological tumour from 2010 until 2016 incidence year. The increase in the number of EPATH reports received per haematological tumour diagnosed is shown in dark blue. And in light blue, we show the, increasing, we show the decreasing number of non-EPATH reporter notifications per tumour. In red, we show the decreasing DCO percentage. While these decreases cannot be directly attributed to EPATH, the figures demonstrate a co correlation between the decrease in the DCO percentage and the staggered implementation of EPATH. So where to from here? So there is ongoing developments to EPATH ca case finding AI to keep up to date with changes to reportability and the addition of new test types. Obviously, we would like to extend EPATH reporter to all Victorian pathology labs and have 100% electronic reporting. However, with 94% electronic reporting, we can now introduce more AI into the registry. And this year, we have started a new project with AIM to implement a Brevio technology. So a Brevio is an electronic document processing system that can receive electronic medical documents from disparate sources and match them to a particular case. It can then also automatically abstract information from these documents using AI technology. In our case, we will be aiming to abstract our existing minimum data set, and in the future, we'll use AI technology to expand our data set. So near real-time data flow from pathology labs means that this information can also be easily assessed for other services, such as supporting multidisciplinary team meetings and for recruiting to clinical trials. Thank you. That's the last slide. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Today I'm going to be talking about a, a topic that I think is going to revolutionize not only pathology, but also has implications for um, cancer surveillance, and that's the future of digital pathology. So I'll be touching on what the present, current, and future digital pathology innovations are in surgical pathology. Um, discuss um, some implications for the cancer surveillance community, both locally and globally, as well as discuss um, what we need in terms of infrastructure and training. So the question I often get is, what is digital pathology? It's not just EPATH uh, reporting, which I will not be focusing on. So this is going to be a nice compliment to your actually talk. I'll be focusing on whole slide images, um, virtual microscopy, and a new concept, um, well, relatively new concept, in vivo microscopy, which I find fascinating. There are many different types of digital pathology images. Um, you have everything from on the far left, the old-fashioned microscope with a camera attached to take pictures. Um, now you have whole slide scanners that are becoming more and more efficient with time and improvement in technology. 
And then you have robotic microscopes. I think this is fascinating. So you can have a pathologist at home or in another institution access your microscope through the internet and drive the microscope. So with a, somebody putting the slide on the microscope stage. So it's pretty exciting. And then image analysis systems, which I'll touch on. What's allowed this acceleration in digital pathology has really been innovations in whole slide imaging, IT infrastructure, and improvements in network processing speed, computing power improvements, and software applications. And really, we need to think about this on a global scale because digital pathology is mostly implemented in the US and, and Canada and, and Europe. Um, however, the, the countries that need it the most um, in Africa and other resource poor settings don't have the infrastructure in order to support digital pathology. So it's something just to think about. Um, there are lots of advantages to digital slide images. They're permanent. You can't roll over them with your chair by mistake and break slides, which I did many times as a resident, unfortunately. You can't lose slides um, because they are permanent images that can be backed up. It allows for telepathology to be possible. So instead of pathology being a silo practice, a local practice, you can have a pathologist clear around across the world getting uh, in a resource poor setting, getting a consult from a pathologist who's a subspecialty expert and world renowned in that tumor. Um, and so it's really made the pathology a global practice. And a lot of pathology departments actually are, have the academic departments in the, um, in the US and Europe have instituted telepathology services. Um, some of the disadvantages are that these slides are huge. They're one to two gigabytes. So you need your IT department on board in order to implement this in your hospital system or in your registry. Um, and data storage and training of personnel are really critical. Whole slide imaging and digital pathology and virtual microscopy are such, so important that the College of American Pathologists in 2013 came out with guidelines on how to um, validate whole slide imaging for use in surgical pathology practice. And then fast forward four years later, the FDA approved um, marketing of a whole slide imaging system for use in surgical pathology practice. Some of the applications in um, digital pathology, um, mostly it's in research and education at this point, but there are some uses. Um, I already mentioned global telepathology. And um, just kind of think about this, that there are 19,000 people in the US per pathologist. In Africa, there are over 1.8 million people per pathologist. I find those statistics staggering. And I think this is something that is really critical that people in these resource poor settings or the pathologists in these settings are carrying a much heavier burden and, and than the pathologists in the US and they need these resources, the infrastructure to be developed more than any other part of the world. Um, other things that digital pathology can do to make the um, surgical pathologist job much more efficient are things like counting mitotic figures and staining IHC um, immunohistochemical stains. But also in something that's really critical now is quantifying tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or TILs, which in some cancer sites are more important than stage in predicting disease outcome. This is an example of um, automated digital image analysis. You can see the slide on the upper left. Um, it, the slide gets digitally scanned, and an algorithm can be developed to decide what is tumor, what's not tumor, um, within that tumor, and how close are in that tumor are the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And this is particularly important in colorectal cancer. Another topic that's um, really interesting and in innovations that I find fascinating are, is this concept of in vivo microscopy. And so it can be done with um, infrared light or fluorophores being um, introduced at the site that you want to, to do the um, in vivo microscopy. And this is an example of um, an oral mucosa. And what you can see in the middle top uh, figure 
is um, their little dot, those little dot, bright dots are nuclei, and they're evenly spaced, it's orderly, and the corresponding oral mucosa histology h &E slide is to the right of that. In contrast, in the middle bottom figure, you can see that the nuclei are much larger, they're chaotically arranged, and the corresponding h &E is on the right, bottom right. So this is actually a technology that has multiple applications. It can be used um, for intraoperative frozen section diagnosis to decide, help the surgeon and pathologist decide, is there more tumor left in the patient and should we be going back and getting more tissue to get a clean resection margin? It can also be used to find occult disease. So if you have an endoscopist who can't see something with their naked eye but they see something on in vivo microscopy, that tells them that that's where they need to take the biopsy. So what does all of this mean for cancer surveillance? I really think that ePath reporting, digital pathology, all these tools are just going to be another data source um, that needs to be mined. And really, we need the infrastructure developed globally, not just locally. We need it globally. Um, especially for resource poor settings, um, skilled personnel, IT solutions, and development and adherence to standards are really critical. So I like this figure because I hear from um, tumor registrars that this is sometimes what they feel like with a rock on their back trying to make an uphill climb with all the emerging data elements, especially with the explosion and the innovations in molecular pathology. There are just too many data elements to be captured by a single tumor registrar. So I think that the pathologists can also, you know, feel like there's a rock on their back and they're doing an uphill climb. So I think this is really critical that um, these tools are not going to replace the pathologist or the tumor registrar. I think they're just going to be really aid um, and make um, the tumor registrars um, and pathologists' jobs more efficient and accurate for patient care and research. Um, and with that, that's um, end of my talk. And if you have any questions, um, there's my email address and feel free to email me if you'd like to discuss anything further.